Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, I should say my name is Anna Shamu, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Aberdeen, uh, where I work with the uh, theoretical evolutionary genetics of inbreeding mating systems. Uh, so that's population where uh, populations where inbreeding, uh, which is the, the mating of, of close relatives, is very much the, the norm. And uh, these actually in, exist in quite a few uh, very different branches of the, the tree of life. So we now have examples of spider populations, and insects, mammals, and even plants as well, where uh, populations are highly, highly inbred because uh, inbreeding is actually maintained uh, through evolutionary time. And uh, I'm quite keen on understanding how populations can actually transition from an outcrossing mating system to an inbreeding mating system. And I'm also interested in understanding why uh, populations can remain stable and avoid extinction uh, despite being highly, highly inbred. Uh, and that's what I'll be talking a little bit about uh, today. Uh, so before going to that, it might be useful to uh, give a little bit of background. Uh, why would we expect uh, highly inbred populations to be more likely to go extinct? Uh, what are the genetical consequences uh, when uh, relatives just decide to, to get it on? Uh, well, to explain that, uh, I've shown a little diagram here. Uh, and uh, this shows uh, self-fertilization over a few uh, consecutive uh, generations. And uh, as you can see, uh, heterozygosity decreases with self-fertilization, which is just an, an, an extreme case of inbreeding. And uh, this is so, in a very, very classic sort of Mendelian uh, fashion. You can see that the amount of heterozygosity you have at all the loci actually is halved every single uh, generation. And it's been on for actually 100 years now. Uh, that uh, this generalizes for all levels of inbreeding. So if you have some uh, inbreeding coefficient f, well, that translates to a decrease in the expected heterozygosity uh, at all loci of your population compared to the sort of uh, random mating uh, scenario. Um, now, why is this important? Well, uh, this decrease in heterozygosity actually give rise to, uh, gives rise to a phenomenon known as inbreeding uh, depression. And uh, inbreeding depression is uh, this decrease in fitness you see when you take the uh, fitness of a population and plot it against its inbreeding coefficient. So for some level of inbreeding, you can see uh, a resultant decrease in fitness. And this decrease in fitness is typically uh, defined as uh, inbreeding dep depression. And this comes about because uh, decreased uh, heterozygosity by definition means increased homozygosity. And increased homozygosity means that uh, deleterious recessive alleles are uh, much, much more expressed and it also means that you lose genetic diversity at loci with overdominance. And uh, that once again uh, decreases fitness. Uh, so that actually gives rise to uh, this decrease in fitness that you typically see in inbred uh, populations. And it's also worth uh, pointing out that inbred populations have much lower effective population sizes simply because uh, inbreeding is a highly non-random uh, process. Mating becomes um, highly non-random, which decreases the effective population size. That means genetic drift is more important. And that means that deleterious recessive mutations, actually any deleterious mutation can uh, accumulate more easily in these populations. Uh, so there's uh, a couple of different reasons why we would expect uh, highly inbred populations to be uh, less fit and less uh, resilient and more likely to go extinct uh, over time. And I'm uh, quite keen on studying uh, how populations that are highly inbred have actually managed to survive for uh, millions of uh, generations despite these uh, obstacles. And to study that, I use uh, individual-based models. Um, and I'll just go over the uh, main features of this uh, model that I've been using uh, so far. It's a genetically and spatially explicit model. Uh, so that means that all individuals have a, a well-defined position in space uh, in this model. And they also have a well-defined uh, genome, their own genome. These individuals are deployed and sexually reproducing and they exist in discrete generations where they uh, sort of accumulate uh, mutations. And um, dispersal between these sort of different patches in the spatial structure of the model is determined by a quantitative trait. So these individuals have genetic variation in the numbers and types of deleterious mutations they contain and also in the dispersal tendency. These uh, deleterious mutations uh, we get by sampling uh, dominance and selection coefficients from different uh, probability distributions in order to obtain uh, what experimentalists tell us is a sort of a realistic distribution of um, dominance and selection coefficients uh, or a sort of realistic correlation between the two in order to have a nice um, sort of realistic distribution of fitness effects uh, of the mutations that we introduce into these uh, populations. And um, these uh, populations, sorry, these mutations actually allow us to uh, define a fitness function where uh, the fitness of individuals 
is a function of the numbers and types of mutations. So the fitness uh, W of some individual is actually just the uh, product of all the effects of the heterozygous mutations multiplied by the, <coughs> excuse me, the product of all the um, uh, effects of the uh, homozygous mutations. So in this model, fitness uh, effects are multiplicative. That's been shown to be a fairly accurate way, or reliable way of, of um, um, estimating mutational effects when you have a large number of mutations as we do in this model. So that's the sort of uh, spatial, uh, sorry, the, the genetical side, uh, the genetical architecture of the model. I'll just quickly explain the spatial uh, structure of the model uh, as well. Um, here you see a snapshot of the whole metapopulation and uh, every single dot here is actually a single individual. And maybe you can just dimly make out that these individuals exist in these sort of um, rectangular blobs, these different subpopulations. And um, each individual is colored by uh, their fitness or the value of the equation I just uh, showed before. So in these subpopulations, individuals can actually migrate to uh, other subpopulations. And uh, just, just to be clear, these uh, sort of rectangular blocks I'm talking about, I've just outlined one in, in red here. This would be a subpopulation with, just like other subpopulations, a well-defined X and Y coordinate. Um, and this, this subpopulation has a fairly high average fitness value. And uh, this one over here, for example, uh, has accumulated more <coughs> deleterious mutation is, and, and have a, a lower uh, fitness value. Now, when you run a lot of replicates with this model, uh, you actually see quite different uh, patterns. Uh, sometimes you get uh, quite simple and, and predictable patterns like I've shown in panel A and B. Uh, that is, if you uh, monitor the metapopulation size so the number of individuals throughout the whole simulation, sometimes you get fairly uh, boring dynamics where uh, after a while, the population just completely flatlines. It just accumulates a lot of deleterious mutations. So just pulls a T-Rex and just goes completely extinct uh, and hits a metapopulation size of uh, zero after uh, some thousands of generations. Uh, however, for the exact same parameter value, sometimes you actually get these crazy uh, recognition dynamics. So I've shown here in, in panel C and D, sometimes um, the population will approach extinction and then really, really quickly just uh, bounce back. Uh, dispersal will occur. Dispersal will be favored by selection. Recognition will occur and the population uh, goes on to live a little longer. Uh, now, there's, of course, nothing new about uh, dispersal and recolonization dynamics in a metapopulation context. This is all uh, well studied. Uh, however, the one thing that's um, quite uh, interesting here is that uh, we've actually not specified any kind of um, uh, extinction probabilities in the spatial structure. Uh, all of the sort of um, extinction, local extinction and recolonization comes about purely because of the genetical differences between populations, uh, uh, even though all subpopulations have the exact same spatial characteristics. Uh, now, you might notice that some of these uh, populations that have uh, a large fluctuation actually uh, appear to uh, persist for a little bit longer. So uh, that, that's what I looked into. Why are these fluctuations correlated with an increased persistence time? Um, and just to show what this looks like in, um, <laughs> sorry, in real time, um, if you, uh, you, you have these two different patterns uh, shown in panel A and B and C and D. Um, the standard pattern is you have a population that's sort of slowly dying out because of a decrease in fitness brought about by the accumulation of deleterious mutation until it suddenly goes extinct. And you can have a population that just before dying out will recolonize itself. And as you can see, this recolonization is correlated with an increase in uh, the mean fitness. Uh, I think you can see that the color is, is more sort of deep blue here indicating an increase in fitness. So these fluctuations seem to be incre uh, increasing fitness uh, somehow. And we looked at uh, this effects uh, for many different replicates over many different dispersal costs. So if you actually look at how long populations persist for many different dispersal costs, so different levels of gene flow throughout the whole metapopulation, um, you can actually see that uh, replicates with large, fluct large fluctuations uh, have a, a longer persistence time uh, typically. And we are starting to understand why this is the case. Fluctuations, um, they have uh, a few different uh, effects on uh, metapopulations. Um, basically, as shown in panel A, if you take a large number of replicates and look at the mutation load before and after a fluctuation, you can see that uh, fluctuations typically decrease the mutation load. And this is what gives rise to the increase in fitness that you see in panel B. Um, which comes about after a fluctuation. Now, this uh, decrease in the mutation load happens because fluctuations uh, in the population level, they sort of, they sort of uh, result in a burst of gene flow uh, when, you, 
when you have recolonization individuals spread throughout the population, giving this burst of gene flow that allows um, the number of homozygous mutations to decrease. That's what you see in panel C. Uh, and because we now have this burst of gene flow, you can actually take mutations that were locally fixed in one population and remove them by selection again. And this is likely what gives rise to the decrease in the number of mutations you see in panel D uh, that, that follows uh, fluctuations. Uh, now, something that's really cool, actually, is uh, I think is cool at least, uh, is that if you have um, if you if you take a look at uh, the changes in the genetic qualities, uh, they're quite different at the metapopulation level and the population level. Uh, so, for example, if you look at uh, the uh, within population characteristics just before and after a fluctuation, you'll see that the um, uh, as I said before, the uh, mean number of homozygous mutations decreases because of this burst of gene flow, and um, the uh, the mean number of mutations also decrease uh, as a result. Now, if you look at the whole metapopulation level, if you look at um, individuals created by between population matings, uh, well, in that case, you actually have a correlation that runs the opposite way. So yes, mutations still uh, decrease, but uh, homozygosity increases massively. So the whole metapopulation actually becomes more genetically homogenous as a result of these uh, fluctuations. And that also creates conditions that are perfect for uh, perching, that is uh, exposure of deleterious recessive alleles that further facilitates a decrease in the mutation load of these um, populations. So large fluctuations basically resemble a large bottleneck event of this metapopulation. And that also helps facilitating a reduction in the mutation load so uh, just quickly before we finish off, uh, I'd like to point out uh, why this is interesting or why, why I think it's, it's interesting. Um, and uh, that it, it, it's really because uh, we can show that uh, you can get these really, really cool um, unpredictable dynamics uh, purely by specifying genetic differences in the dispersal tendency, having dispersal evolution and, uh, and different sort of genetic um, variation in the numbers and types of deleterious mutations. Uh, occurring in individuals. Um, you don't actually need to specify any sort of uh, a priori um, extinction probabilities of different uh, environments to get these cool uh, recolonization dynamics and to escape what's been called the evolutionary suicide where uh, dispersal is no longer favored despite massive dispersal costs. Um, and uh, this is also quite interesting because it allows uh, for uh, a nice, I think, a fairly parsimonious explanation for how highly inbred populations can actually persist and decrease their uh, mutation load. I think it's, it's a nice candidate explanation because uh, all we really assume is a spatial structure and uh, genetic uh, variation. The rest, the inbreeding, the recolonization, the local extinctions just emerges from the model uh, after that. And many of these highly inbred populations do indeed exist in um, a kind of metapopulation uh, structure. Many of these models that uh, have actually stimulated uh, some of these, uh, uh, the, the building of these models. Just before taking any uh, questions, uh, of course, I'd like to thank uh, my uh, supervisors who've been absolutely essential uh, in this work. Uh, and that's uh, Dr. Greta Buschetti of uh, University of Aberdeen and uh, Professor Jane Reed of uh, the Center for Biodiversity Dynamics in Trondheim and University of uh, Aberdeen. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, I'll be happy to take uh, any questions uh, that you might have.